Welcome to the weekly sermon podcast of Sebastian Christian Church in Sebastian, Florida. Sebastian Christian Church exists to be a place where love meets action, for the glory of God and the good of all people. For more information, visit us on the web at sebastian.church. Thank you so very much for joining us online today. And uh, during this time um, of separation, I want to encourage each and every one of us to make sure that we are staying spiritually fit. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is I hope that you are taking the time to make sure that you're spending some time in the Word of God and that you're spending time praying to Him. There's some great tools out there to help make that as easy as possible. You can download the Version app if you've got smart devices like smartphones, iPads, different things like that. The Version. Bible app has so many different plans and devotionals on it. It is just a great way to take a few minutes each and every day in order for you to continue to stay spiritually fit, especially in times like these when if we're not careful and if we're not intentional about it, fear can very easily take over. I also am very excited to let each and every one of you know that are watching right now that we are going to be resuming worship services on campus beginning June 7th. We're super excited here at SEC. We're going to be sending out more details about that in the coming days, in the coming weeks, to let you know exactly how that's going to look. We're going to have some safety protocols in place. But we are so excited to be able to say that we are going to be able to come back onto campus in order to be, um, in order to be worshiping once again, all together. So hopefully you'll be able to join us that day. And even if you're not quite sure about it or you just don't feel uh, secure in that, that's okay. We understand. We hope you'll continue to uh, join us online. Well, we have been talking about margin. We're in the third week of this series, and we've defined margin this way. Margin is simply the amount of space available beyond what is necessary. The amount of space available beyond what is necessary. And today, today, I want to talk to you about financial margin. That's what we're going to be talking about as we dive in today. Now, why are we talking about financial margins during times like these? You may be even asking yourself, what in the world are you doing, Todd? Why are you talking about money? Listen, I get it. I totally understand. How can you talk about financial margins right now? Well, listen, this is a challenging time to be sure. Many of us may be struggling financially right now. I know that this may seem like an odd choice, but there's something else going on here. See, what we're going to discover today as we dive into this topic, what we're going to discover is that this is actually a great season to do this. That the time that we're in right now is actually a fantastic opportunity to look at and to talk about our personal finances. So, buckle up, join us. Let's start talking about what I mean when I say financial margin. Now, a financial margin is simply the amount that you have left to spend after living expenses and mandatory commitments are made. It's that amount of money that is left over. It's the amount of money once the uh, FP&L bill has been paid, once you've paid Verizon, once Xfinity has been paid, once you've paid that vehicle payment, once you've paid your mortgage or your rent, all of that has been paid. Financial margin is the amount that is left over. Now, why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because our tendency is to take everything, not just money, but everything to the limit and to leave absolutely no room or any kind of margin in our lives. Now, I know that when it comes to finances, one of the things that we often say is, I don't make enough. I don't have enough money to be able to do the things that I want to do or to have the things that I would like to have. You've probably said that before. I know that I've said that in my own life. But here's my argument against that kind of thinking. I would argue the issue isn't the income, for the most part. The issue is not the income. It's the lifestyle. 
Do you ever notice that as our income increases, maybe we get a new job or we get a promotion at work, we get a bump up in pay, whatever that might look like. Have you ever noticed that as our income increases, so does our lifestyle, right? Have more, spend more. That's kind of how we live as Americans. We allow our lifestyles to get out of control. They just roll out of control. It's not something that we necessarily do purposely. It just kind of happens that way. And that's why for many, many, many people, there is so little margin when it comes to our finances. Now, if true margin is the amount available beyond what is necessary, our culture continues to preach to us and continues to try to push us in this direction to ignore the definition of margin and to replace it with what makes us happy, right? What makes us happy? What makes us happy is more than we currently have. That's right, more than we currently have. How many of us have received a bump up in pay? We've received that raise. We've received that promotion at work. We've received that bump in our finances only to find that a very short time later, we really still don't have any money. That everything that we got is all spent up. And it's because, it's because our lifestyle and our choices just suck up whatever extra we've made. And this is a huge problem today. I know you've wrestled with this. I've wrestled with this in my own life. You see, the issue isn't income. The issue isn't the amount it is our lifestyle. And as our income as our income increases, so does our lifestyle. I have more, thus I will buy more, and I will spend more. And we allow our lifestyles to get out of control. So easy for this to happen. If we're not paying attention to our financial margins, this is so easy to fall into this trap. And when that happens, when that happens, our margin decreases. And have you ever noticed, and this isn't just true of our finances, this is true of our time and any other area of life where we're talking about margin. As our margins decrease, the very first thing that gets edged out is God. Unintentionally or whatever. God is the one that gets edged out of our life. In the Old Testament book of Proverbs, Solomon wisely states these words in chapter 21, where he just simply says this. He says, Precious treasure and oil are in the dwelling of a wise person. They're in the dwelling of a wise person, but a fool consumes them. Treasure and oil are in the possession of a wise person, but a fool consumes them. Here's what, here's what that's simply stating. It's simply stating wise people, living wisely, those that have created financial margin in their lives, exercise foresight, self-discipline, and restraint when it comes to their finances. They have margin, whereas a fool, someone that knows right from wrong, they don't care, they go the bad route, every, the, the wrong route every single time. Fools will lack both. Now, if you are committed to following Jesus, if you love God and you want to honor God in your life, to honor God, we have to examine, we have to examine our lifestyles and our motives to see if our spending is God-honoring and pleasing or is it self-serving and self-pleasing? And that's a question each one of us has to ask of ourselves. Now, I realize, I understand and I get that many people don't like to hear preachers and pastors talk about money. I get that. I get that. And it's because when it comes to our finances, it is so intensely personal, isn't it? 
I mean, that's our private area. Leave it be. Don't talk about my money. I don't care what else you talk about, but leave my money out of it. But I want to tell you why I'm talking about it. I want to tell you why preachers have to address it. It's because, ultimately, it's a spiritual issue. Your view of money, your view of stuff, your view of your finances is a spiritual issue. And God is interested in what you do with your money. It's not because he needs it. God doesn't care how much you make. But he knows that what we do with our money is an indicator of what's going on in our hearts. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus speaks to this very issue. Jesus very clearly speaks to this issue. When he is talking about what living in God's kingdom is like, what our attitudes and what our behaviors and what our actions are, what he's talking about is that this is a matter of the heart. Take a look at verses 19 and following. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Now, treasure in heaven is not just finances. It's not just our stuff. It actually is all the obedient things that we do for God. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust where neither moth and rust destroy, and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see what Jesus just did? Jesus is saying, the primary way to know what is going on in a person's heart is to see what they do with and how they view their money and their stuff. What do they do with it? Where does it get spent? I've heard preachers say it this way. You want to know where your heart is? Take a look at your checkbook. And that's very true. Jesus himself is stating that. You see, where your treasure and your money goes is an indicator of what's going on in your heart. And maybe... Maybe that's why Jesus chose to speak more about money than he did heaven. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Hmm. See, the reality is, the reality is that we have not trusted God with our finances. If we're just being honest, many of us that love God, we've been Christians for a long time. But when it comes to this area of finance, we just simply have not trusted God the way he would want us to trust him. And that's why so many people today, including many Jesus followers, I know because I talk with people all the time, many people today are living on the edge of financial ruin, have absolutely no margin in their finances whatsoever, and have all kinds of money problems simply because they've never taken time to create that margin. Usually, the last thing that we will surrender to God in our lives is our finances. Is that true of you? Do you wrestle with that? Do you struggle with that personally? You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, gives us a perspective on this. He had a, a young protege named Timothy. And Paul was trying to teach Timothy in two letters that he wrote for him. And in the first letter, in chapter 6, he's trying to help Timothy understand that there are going to be many people out there that are going to speak false things about Jesus. They're going to try to teach false things about Jesus. They're going to do all these things for their own personal gain, their own personal benefit. And Timothy needs to be aware of that as well as to avoid that. And the best way to avoid that is to fight against human greed. And so Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning right here, he says, teach 
and encourage these things. If anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but has an unhealthy interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. Now, we see this played out in modern times, don't we? It goes on to say this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into the temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. And then he says this, and maybe you've heard this verse before, whether you've gone to church a lot or not. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Paul doesn't say having money is evil. That's not wrong. He says the love of money is a root of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith for their own personal self-interest and pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul's just simply saying this. We can't serve God and our stuff. And if we don't have any margin in our life, we end up every time serving our stuff. Maybe not intentionally, but it happens. Do you ever feel or do you ever find that you'd like to give? You'd like to be more generous, but you can't because there's no room for margin? Do you ever find that there's, there's tension and there's stress and that you're sacrificing important relationships, maybe in your marriage, maybe with your kids, with your friends, people at work, all for the sake of your stuff? You end up serving your stuff. You've bought so much that you have to work extra hours get another job to try to pay for it, and that's taking you and that's pulling you away from things that are really important. If you don't have financial margin, what you end up doing each and every time without fail is you rob God. You rob God. Because you can't participate in helping fund his kingdom all over the world. Because there's no margin for you. You can't allow God to do some incredible things in you and through you to be a blessing to other people because you haven't allowed for any kind of margin financially in your life whatsoever. And ultimately, ultimately, a lack of margin puts you at odds with your Heavenly Father. What would it look like, however... If your life was more characterized this way, Father, use me, use my finances, help make me a generous and available person, help me to see that my, help me to see that my stuff can be used by you, help me to view my stuff the way that you view it, God, help me to, to, to make an impact in your kingdom because I have created financial margin in my life. Here's what I've discovered in my own personal life. God doesn't need my money, but he wants my heart. And when my heart is in tune to him, and I'm able to give generously, and I'm able to give freely because there's some margin in there, What God does with my money, I have no idea. But because I believe that God is sovereign and powerful, I believe that he's going to do incredible things if I will simply be faithful. But see, when there's no margin, 
we will end up serving stuff by default. It's not that we don't love God. It's just there's no margin to live how he's asked us to live. And so this is a serious issue. And in our attempts to get the most out of life, we end up losing control of our lives, don't we? In the interest of getting the most out of our lives, trying, trying, to, trying to live that American dream, what we end up doing is we just we lose control. And in our attempts to get the most out of our finances, to get the most out of our money, we lose control of our financial stability because we've allowed margins to decrease. So, because as a pastor, I want something for you, not from you, for you, let me give us a few very practical tips and suggestions on how to begin to create financial margin in our lives so that, number one, we no longer rob ourselves of financial of of our financial margins, and number two, we no longer rob God of what belongs to him. And our lives will be so much better for it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to prioritize our life. I spoke last week about our time. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and the exact same thing is true in our personal finances. Put God first in your finances. How do we do that? It is grasping the principle of the tithe. Now, the tithe is not giving your money to the church because they make you feel guilty or you're afraid that God's going to get you or you know, you're not going to be a member anymore. That has nothing to do with it. Some of you, I realize, you may have come out of some pretty ugly situations in, in your church background, your faith background, where it just seemed like they were always asking for your money and you had no idea what was going on with it. And when you did know something was going on with it, it, it wasn't a good thing and it made you very skeptical. I understand that. I get that. I've seen that happen in my own life. But tithing is simply an expression of priority. That's all it is. It teaches you to put God first in your life. Before you pay FP&L, before you pay the rent, even before you buy groceries. Tithing teaches you to put God first. Secondly, it is simply an expression of gratitude. God, thank you. Thank you for providing the finances necessary for me to live. It is understanding the gratitude, a heart of gratitude towards God. Third, it's an expression of responsibility. Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. In other words, God gives all of us different levels of all kinds of different blessings, including money. And all of us have a responsibility to use what God gives us for his kingdom's purposes. And that's going to look different for each and every one of us because each and every one of us is at a different place financially. But if you've not created any margin whatsoever, you're not being responsible, you're being irresponsible. Fourth, it is an expression of love. I love giving my kids gifts at their birthday and Christmas time. I love it. I love being generous towards them. I loved it when my parents gave me things. Isn't it nice to, to, to randomly get a card in the mail and maybe somebody's giving you a little gift card someplace because they appreciate something that you've done? I was recently having a conversation, and the person I was talking with said, man, you know, just through this whole thing, it's just amazing. Um, I haven't been working, but, but people are just, they've just been so kind. They'll give me a card, and there may be a, a, a little gift card at Publix in it, or they've given me some cash. It's just kind of helped me get through. We love being generous. It's an expression of love. When I choose to tithe, I'm not doing it because the church has mandated it. I'm not doing it because I'm afraid somebody's going to come after me. No, I'm doing it out of appreciation for all that God has done for me in my life. See, when you put God first in every area, including your finances, 
you end up experiencing his blessings. In fact, in Malachi chapter 3, all the way in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, the 10th verse, we see this. We see this very clearly, this principle. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord of armies. I love that phrase, Lord of armies. That means he's the ultimate. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. See, God tells us that when we put him first, there is a blessing associated with that. Now, I I don't believe in the prosperity gospel and, you know, you just give more and God's going to give you more. That's, I, I don't believe in that whatsoever. But I do believe that when we do things God's way, he will bless us in ways we may never have considered. Why? Because our loving Heavenly Father knows exactly what we need. You know, you'll become more spiritually and supernaturally content when you have created financial margin in your life. For those of you that are Christians and you're doing your best to follow Jesus, what you will discover is that when you put him first, you will be more spiritually and supernaturally content. And I can tell you that from my own personal experience with it, as well as the number of stories I've heard down through the years. When there is no margin, however, we end up, by default, serving our stuff. We don't intentionally do it. It just happens. Think about your own life. Look at your own life. Do you find yourself with that tendency? It's not that we don't love God. It's just that we have spent so much that there's absolutely no margin to live and to live the way that he's asked us to live. And if I'm serious about following Jesus, I can't be like that. Because in our attempt as Americans, in our attempt get to get the most out of life, we end up losing control of our lives. When we put God first, it prevents this from happening. And we're better off for it. And in our attempts to get the most out of our finances, we lose control of our financial stability. And again, putting God first prevents this. In Proverbs chapter 15, the 16th verse, it reads this way. Better a little with the fear of the Lord and great treasure and turmoil. Better a little with the fear of the Lord. God is not desiring for you to be poor. That's not the point. He's saying, listen, it is better to put me first in every area than to have all the stuff and to be in turmoil. Maybe you've experienced that kind of lifestyle in your own life, or maybe you have seen that kind of lifestyle in the lives of people that you care about. God's trying to teach us that it's all avoidable. And you end up with more of what matters. Proverbs chapter 8 says that very clearly. Proverbs chapter 8 says this. Proverbs 8 says, With me are riches and honor, lasting wealth and righteousness. Isn't that incredible? My fruit is better than solid gold, and my harvest than pure silver. In other words, when we put God first, we're blessed. Now, developing the practice of tithing. How do you do that? How does that look? Well, first off, you have to decide on an amount that you can feel good about. Like I mentioned, all of us come from different financial um, backgrounds. We all have different levels of of financial um, obligations and, and things like that. We have to make a decision when it comes to giving 
how much we're going to give. I believe in percentage giving. And the reason I do that is because we all live on percentages whether we know it or not. All of us do. We all live on percentages. One of the best things we can do is we can find out what is the percentage that we need to live on and what is left over. And then make a decision that we feel good about. For some people, we can give 10% with no problem. For some people, because of where we're at financially, we may only be able to give 8%, 2% possibly. And then there are others of us that God has incredibly blessed us financially, and we can even give over 10% if we chose to. But it's finding that percentage that you're comfortable with. Secondly, it's establishing a specific and regular giving habit. Now, for our family, we we try to give weekly. Other people I know do it once a month. It depends on on just your life and, and everything that is going on. But establishing a specific pattern. Three, it's simply relying on God's help to manage your money. Maybe for you, this is an area of struggle. And so you might want to consider praying, Father, use me, use my money, Help me to be generous. Help me to be available. Help me to see my stuff, to view my stuff the way that you do. See if, if, Lord, help me to see it so that I can see it as you do and, and to be able to leverage it in such a way to make an impact for your kingdom, to be a blessing for other people. Fourth, it is let your giving grow with your faith. See, As your faith grows, it's like a muscle. You have to exercise it. As your faith grows, you may continue to surrender yourself to your heavenly Father. And in the area of finances, you may only be able to start out at 1%. But because you're beginning making financial margins and you see things getting better, you may say, well, you know what? A year from now, two years from now, maybe I'm, I'm up to 5%. Maybe I can get to 6%. Maybe you set a goal. See, when we surrender this part of our lives over to our Heavenly Father, He's going to lead you into a place of financial margin. Because what you do with your money matters to God. And the reason that it matters is because it is an indicator of what's going on in your heart. Jesus' words, not mine. And here's the reality. All of us, whether we are in our teens, our 20s, our 30s, on from there, only have a little bit of time and a little bit of opportunity in our life And it is vital that we leverage that time and we leverage those opportunities wisely for the sake of something much bigger than us. Namely, God's purposes and His kingdom's work in our lives. So important that we do that. So very important. So when you put God first in your finances... Because you've created margin to do so. Here is what you're going to discover over time. You're going to discover that your needs will be supplied. Your needs will be supplied. You're going to discover that your faith will be confirmed. Wow, God, I trusted you and you came through. And ultimately, you're going to find that your life will be enriched. You will be better because of it. So, as you continue to surrender yourself to your Heavenly Father, He is going to continue to lead you to a place of financial margin. Because what you do with your money matters to God. Because it is an indicator of what's going on. Father, first we have to acknowledge that all things come from you. We have to remember that you are the sustainer 
of everything. That, Father, our finances are ultimately a gift from you that you've allowed us to have. So, Father, I pray that you will give us the right perspective on it. Father, I want to pray for those right now that because of this pandemic are really struggling financially. And I pray that you will give them the courage to surrender to you. And as they do that, as they surrender, that, Father, you will supply their every need, that you will grow their faith, and that their lives will be better for it. Father, for some of us that are Christians, we're struggling in this area because in our past, we've seen finances used and abused way too often and we simply have trust issues Father I pray that you would help us with those trust issues I pray that you would help us to see the bigger picture and Father I pray that as your people wanting to please you that you will help us to be generous So help each and every one of us to create financial margin in our lives so that you may be honored and that we can participate in your kingdom's work. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to today's message. If you'd like to partner with the ministries here at Sebastian Christian Church or find a community through a life group, you can visit us on the web at sebastian.church.